Good morning. You can join me in opening your Bibles to the letter of 1 Peter. We're looking at chapter 1, verses 13 to 21. And if you don't have a Bible with you, you can find one nearby under some seats in front of you. And this is on page 1014 in those Bibles. And uh, just a reminder, we've given away these 1 Peter Scripture journals, which have the text on one side and lines on the others for you to take notes. Uh, those, there's still have a bunch available in the lobby at the Resource Center. So if you haven't gotten one of those and you'd use that for this series um, to take notes in or to memorize or read ahead of time, please grab one at the Resource Center um, after the service, or you can get up now um, and do that as well. Well, we believe that the Bible is God's very heart to ours. And so we use this time to hear from Him in His Word uh, for the change only He can bring. And so we um, practice what's called exposi- expositional preaching, which means we take the main point of the text, and that becomes the main point of the sermon. So we want to hear from God and His Word here. Well, every July, I go on a several-day backpacking Uh, We're rafting trip with a group of longtime friends. We've been doing this for about a decade and a half now, and over time, we've noticed that there is one main difference from the way that we would approach these trips when we were 18 or 19 to the way that we approach them now. And that difference is that we are far more prepared for what is to come than we used to be. One of the first times we went to Colorado, one of the guys was completely unprepared, We are, the group was backpacking, and this gentleman brought his things in a garbage bag and a laptop case. (laughs) A few years ago, someone joined our trip who had never come before. We had a day-long climb up a mountain with 40 to 50 pounds of gear, and he showed up wearing jeans, and thrown over his back was a rifle and a duffel bag. (laughs) He was much better prepared the next year. In our text today, Peter shows us that the Christian life is a journey through wilderness. One of the words Peter uses for Christian, a Christian identity is uh, sojourner. He calls us sojourners and exiles in this letter. That means we are out of place in the cultures of this world. It also means that we have a destination that we're traveling toward. So this culture, this society, this nation or whatever culture, society, or nation you find yourselves in in the future, that is not your truest home. Our home is with Christ and the new creation to come. And Peter says that our life as Christians parallels the ancient Israel's journey through the wilderness. So Israel, when we think of the origin of their story and when they were set free from slavery in Egypt, they were set free and brought out of Egypt, but then they had to travel on the way through the wilderness to the promised land. They had a long period of time between Egypt and their promised land. They were on their way but not yet home. They were sojourners through the wilderness. And Peter parallels Israel's journey through the wilderness and Christian's journey through the world right now. So in the past, if you are a Christian, you have been set free from your slavery to sin and its addictive grip on your heart and set free from the penalty of eternal death. You have been forgiven of your sins. And in the future, you will enter the new creation to come when Christ will return and the whole world, the whole earth will be reborn and renewed. But now... We live in the wilderness as exiles and sojourners on the way. So Peter is writing the section that we're about to read to show how to travel well through the wilderness of this world. He gives us expectations so that we can live in the wilderness of this world. If we don't grasp what he says here, we won't be prepared for this journey. We won't make the progress that we should be making, and we may be led off the path to wander away. So let's read 1 Peter Chapter 1, verses 13 to 21, and then pray. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, 
You shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile or your sojourning, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this gift of being set free from sin and death, available to all who come to Jesus with empty hands. We thank you for the future hope of the renewed creation, where all your your people will be with you forever. And we thank you for giving us guidance in the meantime here, in our time of sojourning. So we pray that you would give hope and help for us in all of our weakness and need. And we pray that we would embrace our identity as your chosen people who are also sojourners right now. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this shows us how to live as sojourners in the wilderness as we travel toward the new creation. So Peter tells us what to do with our minds during this time, what to do with our conduct, and what to do with our hearts. So we'll see the exiles or the sojourners' mind, the exiles' conduct, and the exiles' heart. So how do we live in exile right now, when this world is not our home. Well, first, what do we as exiles do with our minds? Peter calls us to set our hope on Christ's return. Verse 13 shows us this. He said, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So notice Peter's focus on our minds in this verse. He says, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. He's telling you as a Christian to get focused, pull yourself together, get the right mindset. And that phrase, preparing your minds for action, that may uh, come across differently in maybe your translation, especially if you have an older one. It's translating a phrase that may sound odd to us. Peter literally says, gird up the loins of your mind. The metaphor comes from a culture where people wore more long and flowing clothing, and so if they needed to start running or go on a journey or get prepared to work hard, they had to gather up those clothes and tuck them into their belts so they could get going and not be encumbered. So we now use the metaphor of rolling up your sleeves and getting to work. Peter's saying, Christian, now is not the time for laziness. It's time to get going. So if you are a Christian, roll up your sleeves. Peter makes a number of subtle references back to the story of Israel in the wilderness throughout this text. This is the very command that God gave Israel as they were preparing to embark on their journey into the wilderness. The night Israel left Egypt, God called them to gird up their loins. Get ready. Let's go. And they needed to get ready to leave and start the journey. They were about to go and head to the promised land. And so we must now have the same mindset that Israel had as they were leaving Israel or Egypt on the way to the promised land. Peter then tells us the main thing we're to do with our minds. He says, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we're to get our minds fixed on the future grace that's coming to us when Jesus Christ himself returns. What is that future grace that will be given to us? Well, this was Peter's focus in verses 3 through 12 that we've considered for a few Sundays now. He said, we are born again to a living hope. So, God causes us to be born again. He gives us new hearts, and we are born again to a living hope that's coming to us. He called that living hope our inheritance that's now kept in heaven for us and will be given when Jesus returns. The language of inheritance came from Israel's story. 
That was the promised land. They were going to their inheritance. So just as Israel was to set their hope on the coming inheritance that they were traveling toward, we as Christians need to set our hope fully on that coming grace, the coming inheritance of our promised land, the fulfillment of Israel's promised land, the new creation to come. We'll inherit all things with Jesus when He returns. And notice how He refers to the coming of Jesus. He calls it the revelation of Jesus Christ. I love that way of referring to it. Because when Jesus comes, He's the main point. Our hope is His revealing. He's invisible to us now. One day He, he will be revealed. In verse 8, Peter had said, Though you do not see Him, though you haven't seen Him, you love Him. So we're waiting to see Him and receive the inheritance of the new creation. Peter's saying, now that you are a Christian, this changes what you do with your mind. You have started a journey. You're no longer at home in the cultures of this world. So pull yourself together. Get focused. Get sober-minded. And set your hope on the goal of this destination. We know what it's like to have hope in a future destination and how that hope can encourage us in the present. When you take a long and exhausting trip, you have to keep the end in view to keep going. When you're in a grueling soccer game, you keep the potential win in view. If you're on a long and strenuous hike, you keep the goal or the end in view. It was the same for Israel in the wilderness. They had to keep the hope of living in their inheritance in the promised land in view. Otherwise, they wouldn't keep going. And this was a real issue for them. They were often distracted and unmotivated. And it led to all sorts of temptations and problems in their life. It's the same for us now. We live in a culture with competing distractions and ambitions. Some set hope on a career, and then they're disillusioned when it doesn't materialize. The promotion doesn't materialize. Or when they retire or lose their job, they lose their sense of purpose and meaning. Others don't have any ambitions, and so they feel depressed and don't want to go on with life. And in a culture that constantly seeks us to get on board with their agendas, we can be easily distracted for the sake of their political aims or money. We get distracted by clothing trends and political agendas and other cultural fads. And Peter is saying, don't set your hope and your mindset and your mind on these short-term, less significant temporary ends. You're part of a bigger story. You have a bigger hope. And so set your hope on the full, on the grace to be given to you when Jesus returns. So where are you putting your hope? Where do you put your mind? What does your mind get fixed on? What ambitions, what goals does your mind focus on most in your life? Are you putting too much time into listening to political podcasts and news programs? Are you immersing yourself in these short-term sports narratives? Are you constantly distracted by social media and cultural fads? If so, practical step, go through your podcast feed and weed it out. Download a Bible app. Think about your nightly routine and turn off the TV or get it off the running news commentary. Replace those ways of cultivating smaller hopes with ways of cultivating your truest hope. Get more immersed in God's Word than you are in the world of sports. We saw last week, read the Bible as a Christ-centered and hope-oriented story. Let your time in God's Word not just be a mechanical to-do list that you're checking, but let it remind you of the bigger story you're part of. So get serious, Peter's saying. Roll up your sleeves, prepare your mind for action, and set your hope. Actively, intentionally set your hope on the future return and renewal of all things. So this is the Christian exile's mind. Set your hope fully on the return of Christ. So second, what about the Christian exile's conduct? What about the way we're supposed to live? How does being a Christian exile or sojourner in the wilderness change the way that we live our lives. This is what Peter answers next. He says to reflect God's holiness in all of life. So Peter again is drawing on Israel's wilderness experience to help Christians understand their lives. But now he focuses on how Israel was to live. Israel had a new standard for their conduct. They had all sorts of temptations 
They had cultural pressures around them. And so Peter draws on God's instruction to Israel in the wilderness to inform Christians with how we live in our wilderness now. He says a couple things. First of all, we have to make a clean break from our past sinful and selfish passions. Notice in verse 14, he says, As as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. So Israel had all sorts of passions and they had all sorts of temptations in the wilderness. And one of their temptations was to continue on with various idolatries that they were practicing when they were back in Egypt. Once they left, were let out of Egypt, they also often would desire to go back. They would crave aspects of life that they were missing back in Egypt. You can read this in the book of Numbers. The wilderness was incredibly hard for them. And they started to look back on Egypt with nostalgia. They started to resent Moses for bringing them out. They started to crave and demand better food, better provisions. They started to grumble against God. They fell into deep idolatry and later into widespread sexual immorality. Peter's saying to Christians, you have a set of passions that were part of your former life before God gave you a new heart. Or you still have remnants of these passions in you that are not part of your renewed nature in Christ. So what do you do with those? You're going to face temptations. You have a new heart, but you're not perfected yet. You have tendencies that pull you away from God. You'll be tempted to go back to self-absorbed ways of living. Maybe you came out of an addiction that God set you free from, and you're tempted to return. Maybe you used to be self-absorbed, and now you're tempted to do it again, or absorbed in work, and now you're tempted to make that your main priority again. Maybe you used to love money and have your heart set on it and your mind set on it, and now you're tempted to do that again as a Christian. Maybe you were enslaved to a pattern of looking at explicit images, and you're tempted to return. Peter says, don't be conformed. Don't conform your life and your patterns of behavior to those former passions. Make a clean break from those old sinful passions. So this is important, but it's also framed negatively what not to do. What is the positive vision for our lives? Well, that's what Peter shows us next. He says, reflect God's character in all of life. So this is what Peter means when he says, be holy, for I am holy. This is verses 15 to 16. He says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. That statement, you shall be holy for I am holy, is a quotation from the Old Testament. It's from Leviticus. It's from Israel's time, no surprise, in the wilderness. Israel received the command to be holy as God is holy when they were at Mount Sinai before they took off for the rest of their journey to the promised land. That command was repeated several times to them throughout Leviticus as a summary statement of all of God's commands that he was giving them in the book of Leviticus. And if you go back and look up those commands in Leviticus, we'll see that many of them were focused on how Israel needed to be different than the surrounding cultures. God called them to be a counterculture and a contrast community in the world. The word holy means to be set apart, to be different. It refers to how many of God's commands were telling Israel to be different than the Egyptians where they came from, and to be different than the Canaanites and the other peoples that were in the land where they were heading. They were to be different than the surrounding cultures. And what were those cultures like? If you were here with us last year, we went through the book of Leviticus and we spent some time considering this. A quick summary of this, we saw that God called Israel to be a countercultural, counterculture in three main ways, three main areas of life. The sanctity of life, sexual integrity, and exclusive worship. This was because the surrounding cultures practiced child sacrifice, they were hypersexualized, and they practiced idolatry and divination. Those three themes were also present in the first century Greco-Roman culture that the first Christians found themselves in. Many children were born and exposed, which means they were left outside to die in the elements. 
when they were not wanted. The culture also had widespread sexual immorality. They also worshipped various gods, which Paul called demons. Those three same themes that were present in the cultures around ancient Israel, present in the cultures around the first century Christians, are quickly growing again in the secular and post-Christian West. We live in a culture that does not value the sanctity of life. Abortions take over a million innocent lives each year in America. We're seeing a rapid shift in sexual values with all sorts of sexual practices outside of the context of one man and one woman for life. And many are not just pursuing atheism and agnosticism, but various forms of mystical spiritual practices and divination. There's now a fascination with UFOs and UAPs that may turn out to be demonic activity. The call to be a holy contrast culture remains strikingly similar to that same call for ancient Israel. And the heart of it is the same. It's not merely to be different for the sake of being different. It's to be like God, to reflect His holiness in all of life. The word holy can sound archaic and stale to our ears. Another way of thinking of holiness is to think about it as moral beauty. The Bible often speaks of God's character in terms of holiness, but it also speaks of it in terms of a moral beauty. The prophet Isaiah often uses language of beauty or glory or splendor to refer to God's character. The 17th century New England pastor Jonathan Edwards often referred to God's character as beautiful. The perfect and beautiful combination of love and joy and faithfulness and goodness and so forth. And so we're invited into a new way of living that reflects God's beauty. So this is our new countercultural conduct in the wilderness. So we've seen the exile's mind. We've seen the exile's conduct. Now third, the exile's heart. We cultivate a reverent and grateful fear. This begins in verse 17. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Peter's focus is now on our hearts, and what he says here might sound surprising. He says that we should conduct ourselves with fear. I expected him to say, Since you call on Him as a Father who saves you by grace, conduct yourselves with joyful thanksgiving. That kind of thing is said all over the New Testament. But He says here, since God judges you impartially, you should live with fear. How does that fit with everything else Peter even says about salvation by grace and joy in this letter? Apparently, in Peter's mind, there is no ultimate dichotomy between grace and a coming judgment, and living with joyful thanksgiving and a certain kind of fear. So, what does he mean? Well, there's two extremes to avoid here. First of all, this is not a terrified fear. That kind of fear comes if you think that your ultimate salvation at a coming judgment depends on your works as the, the foundation and basis of your standing before God. You don't think you're secure in God's love. You live with anxiety or despair of ever making it. That creates a kind of terror and fear. The other extreme is also wrong. That's to live with no fear at all. No form of fear at all. You don't realize that God does care how you live. You don't realize that there still is a judgment ahead and that it is according to our works and that every person, Christian and non-Christian, will be at that judgment. So what is the proper way to understand this fear, especially in connection with this judgment? Well, think of it as a reverent fear, a reverent, fearful trust we could say, in God. I think about C.S. Lewis's character Aslan in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. There's a great moment when the children in that that story are coming to terms with who Aslan, this lion, is. And in Lewis's world, this is the Christ figure. And they love him, and they're protected by him. 
And a great little dialogue goes like this. Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. So God is our good and kind father, but he's also our judge. But what kind of judgment are we expecting? Many Christians are confused on this point. They think that since we are, as Christians who trust Jesus, already, totally, now and forever, accepted by grace through faith, declared righteous through union with Christ, they think that there is no judgment ahead. But the New Testament all over the place says that we must stand before God in the final judgment. And what will it be like for us then? Well, Jesus' death and resurrection for us is the basis of our salvation. We are clothed in Christ's righteousness and secure. That does not change. If you are going to be saved, it is not on the basis of any good thing you do. Jesus' death in our place means that he took the penalty of our sins for us, the consequences of not making it through that final judgment. That was given to him at the cross for us. So our end time judgment or the consequence of that, the condemnation, fell on Jesus at the cross. He was condemned for us so we don't have to be. What then is going to happen at that judgment for Christians? Well, at the judgment, all those who trust Christ will demonstrate that they are trusting Jesus through their works. Our works do not earn our salvation, but they demonstrate that we have it. If you trust Christ and you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, then you are safe in Christ, but your life also necessarily changes. And that change gives evidence that you are saved by grace. If your life does not change, then no matter what you think of yourself and what you say about yourself, you are not a Christian. We still anticipate that judgment then where our lives will give evidence that we're in Christ. And this does not strike terror into the heart of a Christian, but it does mean we have a proper reverence for God. We have a reverent fear. As Mr. Beaver said, of course he isn't safe, but he is good. He's the king, I tell you. Now, you may be thinking, I don't know about this. Sounds like Peter is saying we're saved by our works. Well, let's read what he says next. He says we live with this reverent fear, and then notice what he says in verses 18 and 19. Knowing, so you live with fear knowing this, that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So we have been ransomed and purchased and set free by the blood of Jesus when he died as a sacrifice. He died in our place to take our condemnation. We are safe. We are cleansed. We are secure. We are accepted. We are righteous. But notice what Peter says. Our ransom isn't just about making us forgiveness. We are ransomed from feudal ways, from a certain way of living, he says. And so, through Jesus' sacrifice, we're forgiven and set free from the power of sin. And at the judgment, we will demonstrate that we have put our trust in Jesus and received this grace. We'll demonstrate that with our changed lives. Now, to be clear, we are not perfect and we won't be perfect this side of the return of Jesus. But an apple tree does not need to have 5,000 apples to prove that it's an apple tree. If it has apples, even just a few and very small misshapen ones, it's an apple tree. You know it by its fruit, and those apples don't make it an apple tree. They demonstrate that it is one. So our works don't make us into Christians. They show, they show that we are forgiven and transformed. And this is why it's not just a reverent fear, but a grateful fear. We revere God because he is a king who will assess us, but we're grateful because he has accepted us in Christ, forgiven us, and changed us. And so we have total confidence 
as we anticipate that judgment. Fear does not mean uncertainty. It means reverent trust. So we live with a reverent, grateful fear, a proper, reverent trust in God. The point Peter is making here is that this is our heart disposition as we travel through the wilderness. We've been saved by grace. We've been delivered. We're adopted into God's family, but we are not yet home, not yet in the new creation. And so in the midst of the cultures of this world, we cultivate in our hearts a reverent and a grateful fear. So how is your heart disposition in the wilderness? Maybe you have a kind of reverence for God, but without gratefulness and without thankful joy. And so you live with a kind of austere and distant approach to God. You think of Him as a father who's always away, always too busy at work, not really around. He keeps His distance from you, you keep your distance from Him. He's he's a stern man and you're a bit afraid of Him. You don't have a sense of grateful, joyful wonder at His love and His grace. You don't experience Him as a warm, near, caring, compassionate Father. You don't live with a sense of joy, just the joy of knowing Him. You don't know Jesus as your truest friend. Or maybe you're the opposite. You live with a kind of joyful thankfulness for God's grace, but there's no reverence. You get that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You believe that you're trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, but you think that means you can do whatever you want and He doesn't care. So you treat God in trivial ways. You don't prioritize being engaged with His people deeply in a local church. You don't read your Bible seriously. You don't pray for people to know Christ. You use His name in vain and you don't think anything of it, just flippantly, casually tossing around the name of God and Jesus. You're desensitized and unbothered by crude jokes and sexualized content in shows. Peter's calling us to bring both of these together. Christians live with this mingling together of joyful gratefulness and a reverent trust. Fear of, filled with reverence and joy. Fear's not terror, but it's also not nothing. It's a reverent trust and grateful awe of God. So this is the holistic, surprising, radical vision for how we're to journey through the wilderness in this world. When you become a Christian, you find out that you're just caught up in a bigger story. You become part of the new Israel, the church, and you're on a journey through this new wilderness toward the new creation. You've been set free from slavery, you've become one of God's children, And you are now in exile in the wilderness. So what does life look like for you? Well, Peter's giving us a comprehensive vision. He shows that Christianity, think about all three of these emphases together we've seen today. He's showing that Christianity cannot be reduced to only one of these. Real Christianity cannot be reduced to the mind or to conduct or to the heart. It involves all of them. So with our minds... We actively pull ourselves together and set our hope on the coming of Jesus and the new creation. With our conduct, we actively, intentionally, in all of life, seek to reflect God's holiness and His beautiful character. And with our heart, we actively, intentionally cultivate a reverent and a grateful fear. So, if you're a Christian, my guess is that one of those comes more naturally to you than the rest, and one of them may come least naturally to you. So maybe one main task you can have, if you don't already have this self-awareness, I know some of you do, we've talked about this over the years, but if you don't yet, figure out what that is for you. That self-awareness can serve you well. Which of those three do you think you are mainly wired to think about and lean into, and which of those three do you tend to neglect? Some of you are mind Christians. You love that Jesus said to love God not just with all your heart, soul, and strength, but your mind. So you read, and you think, and you dialogue, and you discuss, 
You come alive with ideas, but how much is your heart in it? Is what you know changing how you feel? And is it changing your action and how you treat your coworkers or your neighbors or your family members? Some of you might be conduct Christians. You love that James said, don't be hearers of the word only, but doers of the word. You like to do things. You like to roll up your sleeves and serve people and be busy. You're very careful about the way you live, what you say, how you act. But when was the last time you read the Bible slowly, meditatively, thoughtfully for communion with Him? When was the last time you read a good theology book? Are you experiencing in your heart and with your deepest affections and emotions a deep affection for and reverent trust in the Lord? Some of you are heart Christians. You feel deeply. You look for new experiences of of the Spirit. But when was the last time that you picked up a theology book? And is your behavior conforming more to the world than it is to Jesus? So Peter is giving us a holistic vision here. He's saying that we're part of a journey, and it will involve all of us, every part of us. It engages our mind, it engages our conduct, it engages our heart. So consider which one of those three might be least present in your life, and what's a step you can take to become a more holistic sojourner in the wilderness? Which of those three are you emphasizing mind, conduct, or heart, and which do you tend to neglect? So we're on a journey. If you're a Christian, God has graciously given you a new identity and a new journey. You're headed for the new creation. He calls you to set your hope there and to live differently. So make this a morning prayer. Maybe each morning wake up and think to pray something like this. Remind yourself that Christ and the new creation, not this culture, is my home. And so pray God, help me journey well today with all my mind, with all my conduct, with all my heart. And if you're not yet a Christian, you are welcome and invited and called to join the journey. It's not complicated or hard. You simply come to Jesus with empty hands of faith. You let go of any collection or singular kinds of good works that you have that you think are allowing you to measure up above others so that God accepts you. You let let go of all of those. You also let go of clinging to any of the sins and bad works that you have that you feel like are excluding you from God's grace. You let all of that go and you repent of your sins or your self-righteousness and you turn to Jesus and you receive his grace. And you take the step of following Jesus and that first step is following him on a journey with a new hope. And you're welcome to join us as God's people in this local church as we are a community of sojourners seeking to follow Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning and for giving us clarity about who we are, what kind of world we live in, what kind of journey we're a part of. We thank you that you've given us this reality of being made in your image and then remade after the image of Christ and how this affects every part of our life, our mind, our heart, our conduct. And so we pray that you would help us all to be more conformed to the image of Christ. We pray that you would cultivate within us an increasingly strong hope in the revelation of Jesus Christ and the gaining of our inheritance in him. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.